456 will be our song of encouragement this morning after our lesson, which time we'll sing the first and last verse of that song. Well, this past Lord's Day, we began a study of how we got the book we call the Bible. As I mentioned then, this was a lesson that I had preached back, I believe, in 2013, but at that time I never did complete the lesson, so I hope to remedy that this morning and maybe possibly even go a touch deeper into our lesson on this, on the King James Version of the Bible next Lord's Day. As you may recall, we began our study of how we came by the book we call the Bible by looking at some basic facts about the Bible simply as a book and not the book. Noticing that the Bible is a book composed of 66 individual books within one book, 39 in the section known as the Old Testament, between 1500 B.C. and 400 B.C., and 27 books in the section called the New Testament penned between 45 A.D. and 100 A.D., being a period in total of about 1600 years. We also notice that God inspired approximately 40 men of various backgrounds to pen the Bible in their original languages. Those original languages we noticed were Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, being the commonly known languages of those who lived during that time period and to whom the lessons in those uh, books were being told to. That was the intended audience, and so the language in those books would of course been written in the language that was for the intended audience at that time in which they were written. Concerning the age of the Bible as a book, we noticed at least three other books that range in that same time period, Homer's Iliad, the history of Herodotus, and also the history of Tacitus, being books that are equally as old as the Bible itself. And so, uh, considering the evidence that we have that we'll notice this morning, in the evidence that exists for the Bible as a book being this old, you will hopefully notice that there is a much more greater abundance of evidence for the Bible as simply a historical book than what there is for these other books that I've mentioned this morning that are equally as old. There are more copies and more evidence that this book we call the Bible is in fact a historical book than these other books. And that's something I hope makes an impression upon your mind as we study these facts more in depth. But after noticing these facts, we look briefly at the subject of writing and notice that there is historical evidence of writing as early as 3500 B.C., being around 500 years after the creation, right around the time historians tell us that the Tower of Babel was constructed. And, and then we also have that evidence in the form of a Sumerian limestone tablet discovered in Mesopotamia as well as Egyptian hieroglyphs that date back to at least 3000 B.C. And the tablet that I spoke of being evidence that dates back as far as 3500 B.C., which is within 500 years at the beginning or creation of the earth itself. We then noticed different writing material that had been used throughout history, which the Bible itself makes mention of. First of all, we noticed that people wrote on stone. We see evidence of this in Exodus 31, 18, Exodus 34, verse 1 and verse 28, and also Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 2 and 3. We also notice that they wrote on clay. We see examples of that in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 1. We also notice that they wrote on wood. 
And there's mentions of that in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8, and also Habakkuk 2, verse 2. Then we notice that they also wrote on leather. And Jeremiah 36, verse 23, gives us evidence of that. And then we also notice that they wrote on papyrus, or uh, what is also sometimes called parchment. And we see evidence of that in Revelation 5, verse 1. And lastly, we notice that they wrote on vellum. And then 3 John, verse 13, speaks of an ink and pen being used for writing on such a thing, and that was commonly used for writing on vellum or parchment. So this is the material that the oldest manuscripts, in fact, of the Bible are written on is parchment or vellum or papyrus. And we will discuss this uh, in more detail in just a little bit. Since we have now noticed these basic facts about the Bible, the art of writing, and the material on which things were indeed written during the days the books of the Bible first appeared in history, let us look at the subject of which languages would have appeared in these ancient texts. We've already mentioned the languages but I want to touch on that just a little bit more. Naturally, since those original documents have long have been gone from existence in this world, just like the remains of Noah's Ark, as well as the cross on which our Savior bled and died, how else can we determine what these languages might have been except by appealing to archaeological history and the evidence that it offers, and examine that evidence in a logical manner. There are those that we will look at next Lord's Day in the confused religious world today who have instead arrived at their own theory of what these languages may have been based upon no historical evidence, but simply upon their say-so. And yet they have done so in complete contradiction to what the true evidence really shows us. Those who truly know tell us that the Old Testament was, written, was originally almost entirely written in the Hebrew language. This is a language that is in fact still in use today. It's a language that is written backwards to how most of us were taught to write in school, being that it is written from right to left instead of left to right like we write English. It is also a language that is written without vowels, the A-E-I-O-U that we were taught in school as being vowels in the English language. The Hebrew language does not contain vowels. And samples of this language can actually be seen in our Old Testament of the King James Version and the American Standard Version if you simply want to turn over and look in Psalm 119. You will see there the letters of uh, the Hebrew alphabet that are lettering or numbering the uh, Psalms 119 in the King James Version and also the American Standard Version. As it regards another language that appeared in both the Old and as well as the New Testament, we have some of the Bible written in the Aramaic language. And it is a kindred language to Hebrew. And is said to have become the tongue of the common man in Palestine after the time of the exile in 500 B.C. Aramaic sections of the Old Testament include two words as a place name as found in Jeremiah 31 verse 47 and also Jeremiah 10 verse 11. There's also about ch six chapters of Aramaic in the book of Daniel, starting at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 4, going through 7 and verse 28. And then there's also several chapters of Aramaic in Ezra. In Ezra chapter 4 and verse 8, through Ezra 6 verse 18, and also Ezra 7, 12 through 26, we are told. However, those looking at these same verses in a Hebrew Bible would scarcely understand or notice the difference because the Aramaic language is actually written very similar to the Hebrew language, we're told. 
As it regards the Aramaic language appearing in the New Testament, we see several examples there that several of us may be familiar with. We notice in Mark chapter 5, verse 41, Jesus saying and speaking in Aramaic. There in that particular verse, he says, Talitha kumai, or kumi, which is a translation into English, little girl, get up. We also see in Mark chapter 7, verse 34, the phrase ephatha, which means to be opened in Aramaic. We also know that Christ's, Christ's words on the cross that we're all familiar with, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, or meaning, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is in fact the Aramaic language. And we see that in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, and also Mark chapter 15, verse 34. Jesus in several places referred to his father as Abba, and that is also Aramaic for father. And this term was also used in Paul's epistles to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, and also the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And then Paul also used an Aramaic expression in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, where he said, Marana tha, and that means our Lord come in the English, but that is in fact Aramaic language that appears in the New Testament. However, as to the primary language used in the writing of the New Testament, there is little question today that the language was indeed Greek, but more correctly called Hellenistic Greek or Koine Greek, being the common everyday Greek language used by the common man of that time period. The Greek language was used by the common man as it was known everywhere at that time, much like the English, English language has become universal in many places today. Greek, common Greek, Koine Greek, was the common language that was universally known during the days that Jesus walked the earth. Since we will most likely run short of time again this morning, I want to concentrate the rest of our study on the portion of our Bible called the New Testament, though I might stress again that none of the original documents exist for either the Old or the New Testaments. As it concerns the Old Testament, one of the oldest copies of it was actually discovered not very many years ago in 1947 with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The majority of those scrolls were, in fact, Old Testament, and they are dated, according to historians, as being the oldest copies of the Old Testament. However, though we are told that the Old Testament is profitable for our learning, Romans 15.4, as well as for our admonition, 1 Corinthians 10.11, we are, in fact, New Testament Christians, so we will devote the remainder of our study to that of the historical evidence supporting that portion of the Bible called the New Testament. Being that we've already noticed that the original documents that were God-breathed to the New Testament penmen, being that they were undoubtedly written on the fragile material known as papyrus or parchments, and if we had them, somebody would undoubtedly make of them some kind of an idol and begin to worship them as the created instead of the creator that we read about in Romans 125. What would be the very best next thing that we could have concerning a book than the original? Would it not be having evidence that this book was of such importance that others took time to copy it? Is that not exactly what we do today to documents that are important to us? We take the original, we possibly place that in some place reasonably safe, 
but make one or more copies for us to have just in case something happens to the originals. When we read Acts chapter 8 and notice Philip approaching the eunuch's chariot, do you think the eunuch was reading an original copy of the book of Isaiah? We know, of course, he was not. Neither was Jesus referring to original autographs every time he asked the question. Have you not read? We see that phrase used over and over again in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 12, 3 and 5, Matthew 19 verse 4, and also Matthew 22 verse 31. Was Jesus saying, have you not read the originals? Of course he wasn't. He was just saying, have you not read? And of course that would apply to copies of those documents that were originals that people had at their discretion to use at that time. They were not the original documents of the Old Testament. They were copies. They naturally had copies, and those copies were most likely very prized possessions. In a day and age when there was no such thing as copy machines, one could not simply pull out a cell phone and snap a picture, or do a copy and paste of a scripture from a Bible app on a cell phone or a computer, or lay a hard copy of a Bible down on a flatbed scanner and run a copy of it. None of those things were existent during those days. People took great pains to make copies of originals during that time. And the scribes, the work of the scribes that did that kind of work back then were very meticulous in the work that they did in making those copies. We have a tendency to forget that this book took around 1,600 years to write. And it took around 40 men to take part in writing it. And yet we have above... 5,000 New Testament manuscripts or copies today that stand as evidence that this book has stood the test of time and is actually the best attested book from the ancient world just because of the copies that we have. There is no need really to have the original documents. Yes, that would be beneficial in ways to many people, I'm sure. But as I said, if we had the originals, can you imagine how people would want to make those original documents into something like an idol? Can you imagine if they actually found the Ark of the Covenant somewhere, how people would try to make that into an idol? Or if they actually found Noah's Ark someplace, how they would try to make that into an idol? Or if they actually found the cross and could prove that it was the cross that Jesus Christ bled, suffered, and died on. Could you imagine how people would devote themselves to that created thing instead of what those things actually stand for? I think we all can realize the wisdom in these originals being gone, really when we just simply think about how mankind behaves themselves concerning things like that. All of us know from watching shows like the Antique Road Show and going antique hunting and things like that, that if you can find the original of any book, it's worth much more than any other copy. And yet the newer the copy or the most the oldest copies are even are worth even more and more and more as you keep on going down the line. But the further you get away from the original, of course, you get away from the actual wealth that people or the the uh, the wealth that people try to place upon worldly things like that. The value of those things, and so it's human nature to put a value on things like that. And this is something that I'm sure God did not want us to be doing to a book of instruction. And yet, there are many people today who try to do that very thing with a simple translation of that book, which we will talk more about next Lord's Day. 
However, unlike the Apostle Paul, we do not have, as I said, the originals that he and the other inspired penmen once held in their hands and possibly passed on to other congregations to read among the Christians in other locations as we read in such places as Colossians 4.16 where they passed these letters along to other congregations and intended for them to be read. We also read about that happening in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 27. But we do not have these manuscripts. But what is a manuscript, you may be wondering again. Well, we want to look at that word a little bit stronger this morning too. The word manuscript simply means something written or typed. But since it was not until 1867 that the first typewriter was invented, when we are referring to religious manuscripts or biblical manuscripts, we're talking about things that are written. The material that these manuscripts were written on primarily was that of papyrus and consisted of two main types that were based upon the lettering that was found on those uh, on those parchments that have been found. If you were to find a parchment of the New Testament that you thought was old, you could tell if it was old by looking at the way people wrote on it. Just like today, we know that there's two types of writing. We can print or we can write cursively. And that's the same type of writing that, was, that existed during the first century. Those that were printed in block letters, the manuscripts were called unctuals, U-N-C-I-A-L. And that, those date back to the 2nd to the 4th century, being 200 A.D. through 400 A.D. They were written in all capital letters in block form or printed form. They had no spaces in between the words. And actually, some words were broken in part. Like we do today, whenever we get to the end of a sentence, if we don't have room to put the whole word down, we know that there's a way we can divide that word and put a dash in it and break it up and put the rest of it on the next sentence. Well, they did the same thing in order to keep the columns straight inside in their writings, in these manuscripts except they didn't choose to use a dash and they didn't choose a certain place. When they got to that letter that was the very end of that column that evened up with the letters and the lines before it, they stopped right at that very letter and went and spelled the rest of the word on the next line. So even if you had the word God, you would have a G at the very end of that letter or that line and then the very next letters on the next line would be O-D, finishing out that word. And that is the way that they uh, printed the unctual copies of the, Old, or the New Testament during that time period. But then, as I said, we also had what was called the cursives. The cursives are not as old as the unctuals. The unctuals are the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament that we have, dating, as I said, from the 2nd to the 4th century. But there are a number of cursive copies, and the cursives run from the 9th century to the 15th or 16th century. They are in running script, or what we would consider today, uh, you know, handwriting style. And so, whereas you had printed and you have uh, handwriting styles today, this is exactly the way you can remember the ancient manuscripts for the New Testament. They were written, if you saw one printed, it would be an unctual and oldest. If you saw one written in hand lettering or written in uh, handwriting, it would be a cursive and it would be newer than the unctual and not as... Uh, not as regarded as uh, being worth as much as the unctuals, since the unctuals were older. So the oldest evidence we have of the Bible as a book are these manuscripts. 
of which, as I said, there are more than 5,000 copies in various forms. The oldest and most complete copies are the unctuals, or block printed copies dating back as to within a hundred years of the death of Christ, or the last, last apostle, rather. Being John the Revelator, estimated to have died around 99 A.D., or three years after penning the book of Revelation in 96 A.D. The oldest of these unctuals consists of three main manuscripts, and many of us have probably looked in our Bibles that we have, and we've seen references to these names before, may have not have known what these names were referring to, but most of us are familiar with the names that the Vatanicus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandria. And those are the three most oldest unctuals that we have as manuscripts for the New Testament. The man Vatican manuscript is also called Codex B, and the word Codex simply means it's in a book form. So this particular manuscript is actually a book. It's not just a couple of leaves of paper. It's not written on clay. It's actually in a book form. The age of it is around 300 A.D. It has three columns of writing per page. It is, in fact, missing Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 46 through 28. It is missing Psalm 106 through 138. It is missing the books of Timothy and Titus, missing Hebrews 19 or 9, 14 to the close, and also missing the book of Revelation. It is also missing verses 9 through 20 of Mark chapter 16. But the scribe did leave a blank column of space in that particular area showing that he was aware that verse of these verses being there, and yet the verses were not put in for some reason. As it regards the name of the next oldest unctual manuscript, the Sinaitic manuscript, uh, it is also called the Aleph Codex. And that word Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And I might mention also that going back to the Vatican manuscript, it is called the Vatican manuscript because that is where the book is kept. That manuscript of the Bible is kept in the Vatican Library in Rome and has been there for many, many years, but is not, as I said before, not nearly close to an original manuscript. It is still uh, over 300 years old, and it has not been in the possession of the Catholic Church, even as long as many people may think that it has. And so that is why it is called the Vatican Manuscript. The Sinaitic Manuscript is called that because it was found in a monastery on Mount Sinai. And so they named the manuscript, the Sinaitic manuscript, based upon where it was discovered. It was discovered and gets its name because it was discovered at St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai by a man named Constantine Tischendorf in 1844 when he mistakenly stumbled upon a basket full of old parchments that were about to be used by the monks in their fireplaces. He happened upon these parchments, and he started looking at them, and he realized what he had. He had one of the oldest copies of the Bible sitting in front of him, about to be used as firewood, basically. And so, once the monks discovered what Tischendorf had found, and they didn't know it, before this, they would no longer let him examine the copies, and it would not be until 1859, some 15 years later, that he would return to St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai as being a close friend of the Russian Tsar, looking for these, this wonderful treasure that he had once seen, only, begin, only to begin to leave because he could not find them anymore. He thought they had been burned up. 
But then on his last day, as he was about to leave and go back home, a steward of the monastery happened to mention to him about some old copies of the scriptures that he had. And these copies were indeed those he had seen 15 years earlier, and he would be able to take these copies back as a gift to the Russian Tsar at that time. But around 1933, the Russian government would sell the Sinaitic manuscript to the British Museum for the sum of 1,000 pounds because they needed money. And so both of that manuscript is in the British Library at a cost of around $134,000 in American money. This manuscript was also written in Greek but contained only part of the Old Testament but in fact, all 27 books of the New Testament were in this copy. So what was missing out of the Vatican manuscript in the New Testament was found in the Old Testament, in the, in the newest, or the next unctual that we look at being the Sinaitic. The age of that Sinaitic manuscript was 450 A.D., so it was done just about... 150 years later, possibly, than the Vatican manuscript, according to how they date. It was a manuscript that was written in four columns, where the Vatican manuscript was written in three columns, and it was also missing parts of the Old Testament, but as I said, not the New Testament. The New Testament was complete. And then the third oldest unctual that we find is that of the Alexandrian Codex or the Alexandrian Manuscript. And it is uh, also one of the oldest unctuals dating back to 500 A.D. It, is, uh, in, it was in 1627 that it was presented as a gift by Cyril Lucer as a high official of the Greek Orthodox Church to Charles I of England. And so that manuscript also resides now in the British Library, or British, what was called the British Museum. So the British owns two of these manuscripts now. And the, uh, the Catholic Church owns the other. This particular manuscript, uh, as I said, was uh, the age of it is 500 A.D., it is missing 25 leaves from the book of Matthew, missing two leaves from the book of John, and missing three leaves from Paul's epistle known as 2 Corinthians. And so these are the most important, as well as the oldest, most complete Greek manuscripts that exist today in unctual form. The Vatican the Sinaitic, and the Alexandrian. Two of these have only become accessible within the last century. And all three of these have become known since the translation of the King James Version. However, this does not nearly exhaust all of the evidence that exists for the book we call the Bible. We have numerous other manuscripts, like the manuscripts of Ephraim, which is actually a rescript, or what they call a palimpsest, meaning that it was a, an inked vellum where somebody came in with a knife and scraped the original ink off of it, which was the copy of the Bible, and then wrote over top of it with uh, a message from Ephraim, who existed at that time in history. Actually, whoever scraped it could not scrape all of the ink off, so you're able to see the Bible underneath the ink of that particular version or manuscript, and so it was still very usable because someone was not able to scrape all of that original ink off. We also have other uh, manuscripts that are old, uh, as old as the others that we've mentioned in age, but maybe not as complete, we have also what is called the Washingtonius uh, manuscript. And I heard about it. You very seldom read anything about it. 
But I actually heard about that manuscript in a debate by Alan Hires whenever they were having a debate over the, uh, I think it was over Mark chapter 9, or Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. About it, he was having a debate with a Baptist about those verses even being in the Bible. See, where that comes into play most of the time whenever somebody is looking at the book of Mark, chapter 16, if they can't argue their way around all the other verses that mention baptism, they will go back to Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, specifically verse 16, where it says, Baptism, uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They will go back and try to claim that that verse is not even in the manuscripts that compose the Bible. And yet we see evidence even in the one that it's missing from, that it should have been there. And then we see that it belongs, or it is in the other manuscripts. So, you know, they make an argument based upon one manuscript, and yet they don't consider all the other evidence that we have pointing to it. I've got a book at home in my library that just discusses those verses only. It's a book where somebody has went through all these manuscripts and have shown the proof that they actually belong in the Bible. Somebody has written an entire book just on those verses to prove that they belong in the Bible. And so if anybody tells you and argues with you that those verses do not belong in the Bible or other verses do not belong in the Bible, you need to be ready to uh, tell them that you know, maybe you need to study that a little bit deeper. And if you need names of books or anything, to do, any, any different ways to do that, all you have to do is ask me for those. And if I don't know them or have them, I will try to come by those and give, get you the information that you need. But the Washingtonian, uh, Washingtonius a manuscript is also a 5th century manuscript. It is as old as the Alexandrian manuscript, one of the top three oldest manuscripts that exist in the world today. And then we also have the Codex Biza, which is equally as old. And then we have almost 3,000 cursive manuscripts, as well as numerous different ways and evidence that the Bible is complete, like it is. It is the Word of God. It exists as a book, just simply as a book, with more evidence to support it historically than any other book that I'm aware of. And yet, it is a book that many people simply do not choose to believe because of the message that's within it. To those who doubt that we have the Word of God in our possession today, from this ancient and sundry evidence that we've looked at just partially this morning, I would ask the question, how much evidence do you need to realize the Bible is the only book from God to guide us from this life of preparation to our eternal abode in heaven? Do you not realize that if Christianity is a hoax, it is the most elaborate hoax to ever exist with the greatest abundance of evidence that it is not a hoax that has ever existed for a book. It is just simply illogical to think that it is a hoax and that the Bible is not from God. Even though we do not have the original documents, we have more evidence to support the Bible than we do any other book that we are aware of historically. And so the only thing that really is left for us to do is to read the book and study it and come to be a believer in what the book says. God tells us in this book that salvation is available to all men because he will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. But only those who render obedience to the truth, which is the word of God, John 17, 17, will be saved because true saving faith comes by hearing, 
and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. That is because it is only through the Word that we learn of God's plan for fallen humanity in the giving of His only begotten Son as the redemptive cost for the debt which is sin. Our journey to true saving faith, therefore, begins with believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. According to John 8, verse 24, it results in confessing that Jesus died for our sins and that we need to be willing to confess that and believe in that and believe in Jesus as our Savior before witnesses. We need to repent of our past sins as He has told us in Luke 13, 3. And then we need to be obedient to His command to be baptized for the remission of our sins. That He speaks to us and tells us in Mark 16, verse 16, also Acts 2 and verse 38, and so many other examples we could give even if Mark 16, verse 16 was not and could be proven not to be part of our Bible. There are too many other verses that speak of it in action and not just in the commands of Christ. We know that God and that Christ would have commanded it because it was preached to the audiences of those who carried the word out to the world. We do not have to have his direct command. If that was what we needed for everything that we had to do in the Bible, we would not have a lot of information that we need because Jesus did not specifically command certain things to be done. Can you see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus commanded us to sing songs of worship to him? There's not any. We have to get that by apostolic example of things that the apostles did and the way that they did worship according to what we read about in their epistles. But we have evidence of that being done and therefore we have authority for that. Whatever we need in the ways of work and worship in the Lord's church today, we have in the New Testament. And if we cannot find evidence for what we do in our work and worship in the pages of the New Testament, we should not be doing those things. If you find yourself in need of obeying the gospel this morning, we give you the opportunity to do that and extending the gospel invitation to you this morning to become a believer, confess your faith in Jesus Christ, repent of your past sins, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you strayed away from your first true love and the church by committing public sin, we give you the opportunity to repent of those sins as publicly as they're known. Whatever your needs are this morning, please make those needs known as we sing the invitation song.